of silos. Professor Farmer, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this. Well, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. I'm gonna try and make it a little bit different than what I usually do. This I've never given this talk before. Who knows if I'll ever give it again, but uh, I'm gonna try and make it a bit of a story and hopefully we'll have some fun. Um, so I wanna try and talk on a couple of different levels. So on one level, I mean, we're, we're asking about interdisciplinarity. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, how can we make it work better? Uh, you know, do we need it? If so, why? And so I want to talk about interdisciplinary at this sort of functional view of knowledge acquisition, the ecology of knowledge acquisition. How does that work? And is it working as well as it could, or could we get it to work better? At the same time, I was asked to give career advice. You may be a young researcher thinking about, you know, doing something interdisciplinary. Should you do it? If so, when? Etc. I'm not sure I'm you should follow me, but I can at least tell you about my experience and what I found challenging and what worked. I have had a very interdisciplinary career, and so I can at least hopefully you can profit a bit from my experience. So I want to interweave those two kinds of uh, planes of discussion. And I want to use cultural evolution as the explanatory mechanism to think about what's going on, to think about why the culture of knowledge is the way it is. And I'll argue that if you're gonna do interdisciplinary work, you need to understand the cultural evolution of the knowledge ecosystem if you wanna be able to navigate it successfully. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try and do, all, do this in half an hour. I'm hoping you will all have lots of good questions to stimulate the discussion and make it more interesting to fill out the second half hour. Um, so, um, and by request, I'm going to talk about my personal experience. I feel slightly ego indulgent doing this, but I guess I am in this case, the empirical example of, uh, of how this stuff can be done for better or for worse. So, but I want to start back on this functional view of the knowledge ecosystem. And, and I want to contrast the organization of firms to the organization of the knowledge ecosystem. So those of you who are familiar with complex systems may be familiar with the work of Herb Simon as a theory of the firm. And in Herb Simon's theory of the firm, he points out that because we're boundedly rational, we can only process so much information, we can only interact with so many others, that um, we need to um, compartmentalize and modularize and so, you know, there is a um, standard advice about how a firm should be organized. The, the advice I learned when, when I did it is that each person who is in a management role should have roughly five direct reports. So you organize the firm as a pyramid, each that's a tree, there's five branches at every level of the tree and you try and balance the tree as best you possibly can in order to make the firm operate correctly. And in the firm, decisions flow from the top down and information flows from the bottom up. And well, how is that relevant to this? Well, the people at the bottom of the pyramid are specialists. They have a task they need to perform. They generate information or they, they do some functional activity and the information percolates back up. The managers are the generalist and the manager at the top, the head of the firm, is the ultimate generalist because that manager has to be integrating this diverse information about what the firm is doing and making decisions that then direct the course of the firm. Well, let's contrast that with knowledge acquisition. And so when I say knowledge acquisition, I'm thinking about academia, uh, but that's not the only branch of knowledge acquisition we have. I'm thinking about um, you know, national laboratories, private laboratories, um, and the whole culture of knowledge and that comes out of firms as well, but, but specifically academia. Well, it doesn't work that way in academia in particular. Basically, to first approximation in academia, everybody's a specialist. Knowledge, knowledge is siloed. And the way you get a successful academic career is you become the expert on something. And then if you're good, that something grows through time. But already as a graduate student, you probably emerge from graduate school knowing more about some little thing than anybody else does. And, 
and then you grow that domain. But, you know, that has been very powerful, but I think we're increasingly feeling like we're hitting a wall where that mode of doing things uh, can't, isn't able to go where it needs. And, um, you know, I think there's at least a wide viewpoint that um, uh, we need more generalists. You know, there's too many silos. We need more generalists. And, and, but I want to make another point before I go on, which is that note, the reason the knowledge ecosystem is the way it is, is it, it evolves under cultural evolution. It's not really designed. I mean, in principle, you know, the president of the university can say, I want to organize things like this. And there are, so, you know, I happened to get a call a few days ago from somebody at, you know, Arizona State. They're thinking of starting a school of complex systems. And so they're asking, they're actually thinking about redesigning the knowledge ecosystem a little bit to create uh, a, a different kind of place for generalists. But generally, it just evolves. University presidents and deans just have to follow along with the way things are done in the discipline, and that's how things go. Now, um, uh, so, but I've already alluded to the fact in my career, in the course of, of, of uh, since I was a graduate student, I have seen the field of complex systems emerge and evolve. And, uh, you know, it's one solution we have came forth with to, to create uh, generalists and to give generalists a role in the culture of knowledge and the knowledge ecosystem. And, um, and I, I'm going to argue, I'll talk about that, and maybe we'll also expand on that in the question period. You know, it partially addresses the problem, but only partially. Um, but now I want to segue a little bit back to the career advice part of my talk and, um, and talk about what it's like to be somebody who has been a generalist at many times. Uh, you know, there's huge rewards to doing this. There can be, but it's also a very perilous journey. So I want to try and illustrate both sides of that and, uh, and using my own career as an example. So, so maybe to speak on a more personal level for a minute, I, you know, I began my career as a cosmologist. I studied physics because I wanted the, the scientific equivalent of a liberal arts education. I felt like I wanted to know stuff and knowing stuff should start with learning physics. So I devoted myself to know, to, to that. And, and cosmology was what I wanted to do. I went to UC Santa Cruz and I viewed myself in my third year of graduate school as a pure theoretician. You know, I wasn't gonna learn to program the computer. My only tools were pencil and paper. And as Murray Gelman famously said, wastebasket. And, um, and so I was going along and then, okay, crazy stuff. I um, decided to drop out for a while to beat the game of roulette. I uh, ended up learning to program. I ended up sort of leading a uh, effort to, you know, understand the physics of roulette wheels and use the physics of roulette wheels to predict the motion of roulette balls and, um, and actually take it in the casino. I built the first, well, together with several help from some other brilliant people, first wearable uh, digital computer, which we successfully took in the casino and beat roulette with. And then when I came back to graduate school, somehow the world looked different than it had when I left. And I realized I was being pretty silly to imagine that I wasn't going to learn to program a computer. I'd see yeah, programming computers is, first of all, it's fun. And secondly, it's powerful. And so my power as a scientist was vastly improved by that. And furthermore, my interests had really changed. And then I heard about chaotic dynamics from my friend Rob Shaw. And we formed something, we called ourselves the UC Santa Cruz Dynamical Systems Collective. Uh, we were sometimes called the chaos cabal because we were a group of four graduate students who um, co-supervised our PhD theses. And, um, and already we were in a very interdisciplinary situation because we were sitting in a physics department, but what we were doing was experimental mathematics, which is a field that didn't exist at that time. In other words, we were using computers to try and understand mathematics. And back then, 
You know, with one exception in the department at Santa Cruz, all of the mathematicians disdained computers. They thought computers were, they were dirty. And, uh, and so the, the exception, by the way, was, was somebody named Ralph Abrahams, who was very supportive of us. But, but so, you know, here we were doing experimental mathematics and we, you know, pretended our analog computer was like a fluid experiment and we were gonna figure out if there were chaotic attractors in fluid turbulence, how can an experimentalist detect them and, and, and classify them? So that was the problem we set out to solve. Now, then I got my first hard lesson in uh, the dangers of interdisciplinary science when I realized I needed to support myself. Roulette had not given me the, the fortune I had hoped to make. And, um, and so I needed to find funding. And so I applied for some, some, for some scholarships. And there was one scholarship, the Dan Firth Scholarship, I was really hopeful about getting because it was for you know, somebody with outstanding teaching ability. I'd been the head TA. You know, I, I knew I got great ratings from all the students and I thought, good, I, I should really be ideally suited for this. I got up in front of the committee and I gave a great lecture and they said, well, you, you gave a great lecture and this is fascinating. And you totally, you're just the kind of person we would love to give this to. But from what you just told us, you're working in a field, you're a physicist working in mathematics, doing something that's highly controversial. You do not have a PhD advisor. So we view it as virtually impossible that you will finish your PhD. And so therefore we will not give you the fellowship. Well, you know, I have to admit my reaction was, fuck you guys. I mean, you know, if you just only give me the money, I could do it, I could do it. So things look pretty bleak. And meanwhile, I applied for the Hertz Fellowship which was a kind of defense-driven thing. Edward Teller had been on the board. So there was very low probability I would get it. It looked like they wanted people, you know, very technical physicists. But amazingly, they gave it to me. And, uh, and that saved me. So I was able to go through and finish. And then I'm looking at getting a job and I realized, well, I'm probably unemployable just about anywhere in academia, except I did get an offer at Berkeley to be in a plasma physics group. I would have had to do plasma physics half time, but you know they would let me do some chaotic dynamics on the side. And then I went, I also applied to Los Alamos where once again, I thought, no way I wanna to go to Los Alamos. It's a defense laboratory, you know, it's off in the middle of nowhere. Although actually I didn't mind that. I was from New Mexico, so that was an attraction, but you know, I went the first day in the motel there. I said, no way I want to live in this place. And then I went and I gave my talk the next day. I was mobbed at the podium. I spent two days interviewing with everybody there. So I interviewed with about 20 people. I came away thinking, God, they're really smart people here. And they're thinking about all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and they loved the fact that I was interdisciplinary because at Los Alamos, there were no disciplinary boundaries. I joined the theoretical division. So, you know, which didn't mean you couldn't do experiments. It just meant that you could really, you know, think about just about anything you wanted. And in fact, I explicitly asked them and they said, well, we'd be very disappointed if you didn't do at least a little bit of chaos theory. So, okay. So I was there for 10 years. I learned a huge amount. It was a wonderful place intellectually because there were no disciplinary boundaries. People just did interesting science, do something interesting, publish good papers, you were fine. And I had the good luck to be in um, the Center for Nonlinear Studies, which was started and developed by David Campbell. Um, and, uh, you know, and then after I'd been there for a while, uh, the management came down and asked me to form a group for the people that didn't fit in any of the other groups. And, uh, and so initially I said, no. And they said, well, if you don't form it, we'll have this other guy form it and you'll be in it. And I said, okay, I'll form it. So, um, uh, uh, okay. So I formed the group and we had a debate about what to call ourselves. And we initially were thinking of calling ourselves the life and intelligence group, but we decided that was too restrictive. And so, because we might want to think about things that didn't relate to life and intelligence. So we call ourselves the complex systems group. And um, and so uh, I think we were the first group to use that name. Um, 
Meanwhile, the Santa Fe Institute had begun to form and I was fairly actively involved with them. Many people don't realize that they really came from Los Alamos. And um, uh, because people at Los Alamos, you know, the senior fellows realized that there was a major gap in knowledge because there was nobody thinking about these kinds of things. And, I'll, you know, where does organization come from? You know, what, what causes structure? Uh, how do these things emerge? And so, um, so I became involved with SFI, but I wanna say a little bit about something else first, because while I was at Los Alamos, I began to, to also do things. Well, I did two things actually. One was, because I was doing chaotic dynamics, and, you know, it turns out that uh, I was doing data analysis. And so I had people coming to me from uh, all over the place, you know, people with fluid data, people with data about hamsters and their, uh, you know, uh, uh, circadian, circadian rhythms. Um, I had one guy come to me with a data set about rock bursts in mines. And uh, so, you know, I, I, another guy with data from uh, diabetes, forms of diabetes that where your, your insulin doesn't just quit being produced, you have cycles and swings. And so I had data from all kinds of places. So it meant I was talking to people from lots of disciplines, neurophysiologists. I had a lot of dialogue with neurophysiologists because that was a, very, a matter of great interest in the time is, is there chaos in the brain? And so it meant I began learning about lots of other disciplines and I discovered that was really fun because I would interact with these people and I would ask them questions and I would learn a lot about their field. And occasionally we would write a paper together too and that was also very interesting. But then I began a, a serious collaboration with somebody at Los Alamos named Alan Perlson on immunology. And so we wrote a paper on immune networks and learning in, immu in the immune system and um, and you know that taught me several lessons. So this is along the line of, if you're gonna do inter interdisciplinary work, how you should do it. Well, first of all, it's very good to find collaborators who are specialists in the field that you wanna work in. Uh, Alan actually was a physicist by training, but he, you know, he'd been working in theoretical immunology for 15 or 20 years, and he really knew, knew the immunology. So he supplied vital knowledge for the project. You need collaborators for that. But another thing you need, that I've learned the hard way is certification. If you submit your paper, it could be a perfectly good paper, you could have everything nailed, but you're not an immunologist and the immunologist is reviewing it, they are going to turn everything inside out to try and show that you missed something because you're not a member of their club. Whereas if you have a member of your, their club on your paper, then they will go easier on you because they he's a member of the club. So you need it to kind of get into the club. Um, but then the other thing that you should realize is, is when you have collaborators, the great opportunity is you can learn their field or learn the key things you need to know by playing 20 questions. So learn to ask good questions. And if you do that, you can stay on the steep part of the learning curve and learn a lot of stuff very quickly, much faster than you can learn it by reading or far faster than you can learn it by taking a course. Now, one of the things I learned as well when I was doing that is that the scientific method is diverse. You know, I used to think when I was in high school, they taught us this is the scientific method, you know, handed to us by Francis Bacon and, you know, Isaac Newton. And, uh, um, but actually it's different in every field because every field has its own culture of knowledge. They have their, they have a, the, their own ideas about what questions you should ask, how you should go about answering those questions, and how about how you should go about determining whether you have the correct answers. And, and so biology, for example, is very different. It's a field where details are respected, very little theory. Um, the kind of questions they ask are very different than the ones you get in physics. You know, in physics, of course, we think we're the kings of the jungle. Uh, we believe we are the greatest of all scientists, sciences, that, you know, it's the hardest discipline to learn. We're the smartest of all scientists. And uh, we know the most mathematics of anybody except the mathematicians. And we learn the useful good mathematics that they're lost in esoterics. And um, 
So we're, we're very vain and egotistical, but there is a point back there that, you know, it's a very strong and successful scientific method in physics. And, you know, I learned though, that it's not the same in other places. And, and maybe we'll come back and say more about that vis-a-vis -vis economics. Now, then I decided I needed an adventure and I dropped out of a scientific academic research for a while. And I started and formed something called a prediction company. We were one of the earliest quantitative trading companies. We were based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I did that for eight years. It was a great challenge. It was lots of fun. We did beat the market in a very consistent way. We showed Gene Fama was wrong. Efficient market hypothesis. So I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and, you know, it provided me a ticket to freedom in that I made enough money that uh, I, if I didn't get a job in the future, well, that was okay. I didn't really need a job. So um, I, what I did not do was get enough money to fund my own large scale scientific projects. I, I don't know whether I should have stayed and done more of that, but you know, eight years, I wanted to get back to my passion, which was um, uh, doing scientific research. And I went to the Santa Fe Institute uh, when I left Prediction Company. They were in Santa Fe. That made it easy. I didn't have to move. Uh, they also were, you know, a, a complex systems place. That's what I wanted to do. And in particular, I had decided rather than just studying complex systems in general, as I had before, that I would um, combine the financial economics I'd learned as a practitioner during my eight years at Prediction Company with what I knew about complex systems. Uh, I had been reading the economics financial literature and I decided they had the wrong ideas about how financial markets work. I would try and inject the right ideas from complex systems about how financial markets work. Now, again, perils, the, 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 the pleasures and the perils. The you know good side is I think I had some very good ideas. Uh, while I was a practitioner for eight years, I came up with a theory called market ecology. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but the bad side was that I hit very stiff resistance from economists. Uh, and maybe not surprisingly, when you go in and you say, well, actually, you guys are thinking about this problem completely the wrong way. And I have the solution. And you really should think about it like this. You should expect a lot of pushback, uh, which I got. And uh, let me, maybe I'll just say a little bit about the idea to illustrate the point. Um, the idea of market ecology is that draws an analogy to um, ecology and biology. But before I draw that analogy, let me say what the background is. The background theory in finance is the theory of efficient markets, which says that um, prices are set correctly. They fully reflect all available information so that um, uh, prices correctly reflect fundamental values and that prices only change when new information arrives and people uh, rationally evaluate that information and bring prices to the new and correct level. Uh, so this theory has a Nobel Prize behind it, several Nobel Prizes actually. Um, but you know, then you have to believe that markets, well, you have to believe all that stuff I just said, which having sat in financial markets and watched them swing up and down wildly, and uh, I just didn't believe was very plausible. And, uh, and so what is the alternative? The alternative I argue is a theory of market ecology. Financial markets are like ecologies, they have species. The species are financial trading strategies, which are specialized. They have to be specialized because people are boundedly rational. We can't process all available information. We can only process some of it. Our decision-making methods are flawed and diverse. And uh, so we make incorrect inferences about prices. And, but we are organized in an, in an ecosystem where you know, there are different strategies. Prediction company, we were a statistical uh, stat arb strategy, statistical arbitrage strategy. Other uh, funds were technical trading strategies. There were fundamentalists, index arb. There, you know, I could reel off 20 names of 20 different kinds of financial strategies. They're all very specialized. They all have their own cultures. And, um, and so the markets are a pastiche of these different cultures that are evolving and reacting to each other. 
and feeding off of one another. Uh, there are market inefficiencies that feed the ecosystem. Now, so I wrote a paper about this and it was a good lesson in the difficulty in that, you know, it took me five years to get it published. Now, that's partly just because it works that way in economics. I got lots of blowback. In the end, I, I published about half the paper in a regular, you know, third tier economics journal. And uh, I was a sole author, so n n nobody in the club with me. Uh, uh, and then, you know, I had the good luck to meet a guy named Giovanni Dozzi, who was editor in chief of a journal of industrial and corporate change. He'd read my paper, he liked it. He says, Dawn, I will put it in my journal as is. So he just published it as is without refereeing. So it got published. I, you know, I've since become much more expert at publishing in economics, but, um, but that was a lesson. And, you know, so I've, since then my career has been mostly in economics. And I have to say it's been rewarding, but it's been a hard battle. It's re been rewarding because you discover when you enter a new field and you have a new way of looking at it, then there's lots of low hanging fruit. There, you know, you don't have to be brilliant because you're different. And so because you're different, you automatically find, have ideas and do things differently than everybody else. And you can do really good science that way. On the other hand, you're gonna experience institutional pushback because you won't be able, to, you, may, you may have a hard time publishing your paper in the best journals and getting the recognition that your ideas deserve. Economics, I have to say, is particularly that way. Having worked with people in lots of fields, it is a parochial uh, siloed discipline where you know the first thing you have to do is sign up to the religious canon, which says that you know uh, the way to think about the world is that people are utility selfish utility maximizers, and if you don't sign up for that, you're going to hit a headwind all the way. Um, uh, though their cracks are forming, and you know of course. The other side is if you're a rebel, uh, then you're going to you're going to be able to to make some fundamental changes, or possibly uh, you have the it enhances that probability anyway, and you may find other rebels are attracted to you, and you can have the pleasure of uh, an adventure of, of doing that if you can fight and deal with the frustration of uh, the lack of acceptance that you will get. Your, your ride will be harder than it would be if you just join the mainstream. And, you know, I've now spent eight and a half years at Oxford. I've had the pleasure of attracting brilliant minds to study and work with me uh, from all over the world. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great when you have students that are as, as smarter, smarter than you are. Um, and, and being able to uh, get a lot done and have a lot of fun inspiring people to do that kind of thing. I do feel that cracks are forming in the edifice of economics and we are set up to make major inroads. Uh, I am, I have to say, contemplating starting other, I, I feel like I wanna do even bigger project and. You know, it's at the Santa Fe Institute. Santa Fe Institute's a place, it's a wonderful place uh, where you get exposed to people from every discipline and where you uh, have the freedom to think about whatever you want. But on the other hand, you know, at some point I had uh, one postdoc and one graduate student and they got worried I was gonna take over the place because my group was so big. Um, whereas, at, you know, at Oxford, I, I have 20 people in my group and, and that's just fine. And uh, in part, thanks to Bailey Gifford, who has generously funded me. I'm the Bailey Gifford professor there. Um, um, but, you know, in academia, there's a limit to how big a project you can do. And I've decided I really need to do something big and something applied again. And so I've started a company called Macrocosm uh, so that we can do that. Because, you know, in academia, the only way you can get a large project done is if the entire discipline or most of the discipline signs up to it. And there's no way the discipline of economics is gonna sign up to what I wanna do. So I think the only way to do it is out in the private sector. This time I wanna do something that's very open facing and uh, where the knowledge is not kept secret 
and where the knowledge has a purpose, central purpose for public welfare, which certainly what we did at Prediction Company did not. We just made money for ourselves and some Swiss bankers. Um, but uh, so I want to do something much bigger. But maybe to just to summarize and wrap up, and then I'm looking forward to the questions. You know, the world desperately needs generalists and interdisciplinary thinkers in particular. We just need people to synthesize the knowledge. We've acquired all this knowledge at the low level. We need we need to think about what it means and how it relates, how each thing relates to the other things. Um, we need more synthesis. We need more knowledge across disciplines. We um, need to, uh, we need all that stuff. How do we get it? Well, we need to show that we have real success in doing things that way. And, you know, I think, I mean, I, I think, for example, my theory of market ecology is starting to pay off and generate useful empirical results. But we need a body of, of empirical success stories where we can say interdisciplinary thinking led to this. And um, if we're going to really get more support for this way of doing stuff, and we're going to be fought all the way along. You know, every time I've sat in the committee on the math department, first question they ask is, is this person publishing in math journals? And I always protest the instant they say that. I think we sh I mean, I, I throw a fit when people say that because I think it's the wrong question. Um, but maybe we can go into this more in the question period. But if you're thinking about an inter interdisciplinary career, it can be very rewarding. It can lead you to do stuff beyond what you might be able to accomplish if you stay in your silo. But um, at the same time, you should expect a lot of uh, hurdles and challenges in your career. Uh, it, it, it's not an easy path. And on that note, I'll throw it open to questions. So first Farmer, thank you so much for that. That was <clears throat> that was fascinating. And you'll talk about the first couple of cracks uh, in, in economics. Hopefully that's the first couple of cracks of smashing that silo. And it reminded me, I think, of uh, when Ronald Reagan asked for is it a one-armed economist, so he couldn't say on the one hand this, on the other hand that. Um, and on that hand, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Rob, who's going to conduct the, the question and answer section. Rob, thank you. Thanks, James. Um, and also, yeah, thank you, Doyne. That, that was really, really fascinating. We've got a ton of questions coming through. So I'm just going to, to, to jump in the first and we'll see how many we get through in the remaining time. Um, there's kind of a, a point there, which I think you touched on last year, um, around your move from, from a representative agent model. Um, in economics towards more of a simulationist approach to, to mapping out individual agent behaviors inside complicated systems, uh, clashes a little bit with the mathematical foundations that a lot of macroeconomists get educated in today. Um, and so just not wanting to focus too much on the flaws of economics necessarily, but when we're thinking about how that field needs to evolve from here, do you think that there's significant scope for, for changing the foundational training of a lot of math mathematically based economics going forwards, or is that also a mystery? Yes, I think uh, the, 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 the simple answer would be yes, but, but let me elaborate. Um, you know, economics is a field that was colonized by mathematicians in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, unlike, say, theoretical biology, which is a field that was colonized by physicists in the sort of uh, latter three quarters of the 20th century. But, but that difference is important because, you know, there's still economics papers written in theorem proof format very often in theorem proof format. So there is an awe and an appreciation of mathematics in economics that um, can be good, but it also can be bad. And, you know, and economics is almost the last field where publishing a simulation paper in a top journal is virtually impossible. Uh, there have not been any in, in a decade or two. And, um, and, it's about the culture of knowledge that needs to change because you know the digital computer is the biggest break. I mean, it's it's had the biggest effect in boosting scientific knowledge of, of anything in the for the last seventy years, and and you know the economy is a complex system. It's nonlinear. 
The only way you can study a nonlinear complex system, all complex systems are nonlinear. The only way you can study a complex system is ultimately to simulate it because you're immediately led to equations you can't solve. And so you need to do simulation. And so we need to break that barrier down. So it, it's a good example where a new, something new needs, needs to come in. So, I mean, so one of the things that, that jumps out from your career, whether it's with, with the Los Alamos defense folks or whether it's being able to go off and, and, and deploy your knowledge in markets with prediction company, um, is a lot of the places where you were able to pull together perspectives from different fields were, were areas where people were focusing on solving problems rather than uh, training or instilling a particular set of methods. And so I'd be curious your reflections on on how much the, the challenges that you've been bumping into, um, particularly around inserting your insights into economics, have come from something that's flawed in that field in particular, or, or whether this is the side effect of university disciplines and funding systems that are often defined by core sets of methodologies that they're trying to train people in, as opposed to particular problems that they're keen to throw everything they have at, at answering. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think it's very important to solve problems. And and it's really useful to be exposed to real problems uh, because it, it's like having a muse. Um, you, you can be inspired. And, and, um, and, you know, one of the nice things about working in complex systems is that at this point, I've been exposed to lots of problems. And you start to see the same kinds of things coming back in even in very different disciplines and domains. And, uh, <clears throat> and again, if you have success in something over here, you can often use what you did over there to, to come over here. Um, you know, so, so by all means, one should solve real world problems. It's true that in academia, it's easy to get lost in your silo where you think you're solving something important, but you know, it's not actually very important. And, uh, and, you know, I've seen that in, I mean, you know, the whole field of derivatives pricing, for example, is that's another another piece of general wisdom. There's always a cycle in solving problems. When the problem is first introduced, there's lots of low hanging fruit. There's this race to sort of find out the new stuff. And then over time, it becomes more and more established. Everything gets picked over and then it gets harder and harder to do anything fundamental. And people end up just, you know, developing details. Uh, so it's very important to be aware of that cycle. But yes, it's, I, I mean, let me actually come back to your question about academia versus, you know, uh, industry and the real world. Um, not that industry is the real world, but um, I think both have their pros and cons. There's a real pleasure in doing something applied at Prediction Company. We had a screen that showed us how much money we'd won or lost every day. We could we knew that we'd done something real because we we won money much more often than we lost money at a hugely statistically significant level. So we could just go, mm -hmm. we don't care what you think about what we're doing. It's working. We know we're doing it right. It's not a popularity contest. We don't have to worry about marketing. We're just making we have shown that it works. That was a pleasure. It's also a pleasure to work in a large project where you everybody's playing on a team. Everybody has a role. And you you coordinate much more tightly than you do in academia, but on the other hand, in academia you have the wonderful virtue of um, being able to think about what you want, being able to think about fundamental problems, having lots of freedom to change course, not having shareholders and, that, and employees that you have to keep happy. Um, so there there are pros and cons to both. Gotcha. I, I guess one one obvious question that, that jumps out of that and, and ties in with something you mentioned in your talk is around as you look at people in the field of complexity studies and as you look at trying to tr create a home for generalists and also on some level you know, train generalists, how are you going about it in that field trying to make sure that you don't get sucked into the kind of picking over details, our club, your club mentality that maybe grows up in disciplines that have been around for longer? Yeah. So I think the our club, your club mentality always happens. That's sort of inevitable being that we're human beings. Um, but, but, you know, complex systems by its very nature is a generalist field because the whole idea is to think about commonalities across different, uh, different domains of, of knowledge. Um, 
Now, it's interesting, complex systems lives in the knowledge ecosystem. And it, it now has a funny role. It's, it's thriving on one hand, you know, the, the annual complex systems conference has more than a thousand people attending. And that's not even all the people that are really doing complex systems. On the other and and on the other hand, it kind of lives in the in, interstices of the rest of academia. Um, you know, maybe Arizona State will just will start a school of complex systems. You know, Chalmers, Chalmers University in Göteborg, Sweden, has a complex systems degree that one can get, but that's about it. And uh, so, you know, typically there are interdisciplinary centers at universities where people have appointments in other departments where they have their specialty, and then they come together in a center where they do complex systems. And, you know, maybe that's the right way to do things, although I actually think that there is a, a curriculum one could teach of complex systems knowledge that would actually produce scientists that were fairly broad generalists but could still go into specific domains fairly successfully. That's a side story. But so complex systems on one hand, it is thriving. And I note that it's, you know, I was having discussion about this center, who, who would be good people to propose to head it? It's hard to even think of the right people because the good people already have nice jobs somewhere. So my students are getting good jobs. They do have to, fight around the sidelines and, you know, they're not going to go with, into the economics department at, you know, MIT or Harvard uh, because they just won't have them, but they do get good jobs elsewhere and they're sought after. Uh, so I think we need more of that. We need to uh, get appointments at universities at the top level that are really in complex systems and, um, and we need to keep supporting complex systems as a field and keep supporting interdisciplinary work. One thing I might throw out as a mechanism that I've seen work is for a while at least, and I don't know whether they do now, but, but during the first decade of the, this millennium, the National Science Foundation started running a series of calls for proposals where a requirement is you had to have at least two PIs and they had to be from different fields like a physicist, an economist, a physicist and a biologist, you know, a sociologist and an economist at least. So, um, and my experience was that was a game changer for me in getting funding because previously if I applied for an NSF grant, it would go to some specialist and they would always find reasons to reject it because First of all, I was challenging one of their core ideas. And secondly, they could trip me up on some detail that I didn't have right. And, but in, under that program, I got funded a lot. And I think that funded a lot of good research because it sort of forced people into a domain where they couldn't sit in their silo any longer. So I think any way you have of flushing people out of their silos is a good thing. Sorry, long-winded answer. No, but, but, but I think what's really exciting about that is that that points a way to promote interdisciplinarity across a lot of fields rather than just within, rather than just within you know, the complex systems area. Yeah. I yeah. guess one of the other things that, that jumps out from that angle is you're just going back to the PhD and, and, and the chaos cabal. You know, the, the fact that you were allowed to supervise each other's PhDs, it's not quite self-supervising, but it's you, you and a group of friends getting to be each other's supervisors. I wonder, you know, reflecting how important you think that was in enabling you to go off in the direction that you went off in and whether, you know, people who are watching this, who are trying to work out how they want to advance in academia, you, the trade-offs that came with it. I think you've touched on some of them, but I'd, I'd love to hear more. Yeah. So the, the, the good and the bad, the good and the bad was it allowed us to think creatively because uh, we weren't constrained by somebody who had already formed a view. And uh, uh, so that was very positive. It was also a very positive experience, I must say, to be co-supervised by three other graduate students who uh, were all really smart and all thinking, we were all thinking about the same thing, but in very different ways. And so that's a great experience. On the other hand, we made lots of career mistakes. You know, we didn't know how to write a paper. We didn't know how to go about getting a job or, you know, how to ask for le letters of recommendation. We didn't have anybody to really push for us in that. Now, um, we all ended up 
in the end, that was probably all okay. But um, but we did miss out on some things and also clearly missed out on some guidance and mentoring and tutelage that, you know, I can see I'm providing my students now and I wish I had back then. I had to learn everything the hard way. It sometimes feels, and, I, and I, this is an over-dramatization a bit, I think, but, but it sometimes feels like there's a, a terrible tension um, between uh, you know, junior academics going off and studying the things they're really fascinated about and doing new work, and then you know, the homage and the lip service they have to give um, to, to the existing, not only existing paradigms of thought, but the existing frameworks of funding um, in order to build a career. And that tension between career academia and, and genuinely uh, discovering, searching academia seems to run through your biography a little bit. Now, I'm aware that I'm projecting and I'm aware that things are never that black and white. Um, how, 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 bad thing, how bad are things actually? You know, well, do you know they probably are fairly <laughs> black and white, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, although they're changing. You know, uh, I think the standard advice to coming back to career advice would be if you want to do something really interdisciplinary, wait until you have tenure. And uh, once you have tenure, you can do what you want. Now, the flaw in that advice is by the time you get tenure, you are probably pretty set in your ways and you may have a hard time doing that. You may have a hard time achieving this big breakthrough you imagine you would have done, you, that you would have done when you were a graduate student. Um, and, you know, I, though I have seen people who followed that path successfully, they got tenure, then they got collaborators in other fields and then they did great work doing stuff with other fields. Now, you know, uh, I, I didn't follow that at all. I was already doing interdisciplinary stuff as a graduate student, and I did hit headwinds as a result because, you know, uh, the number of places I could be employed was small. Um, on the other hand, I, you know, I wasn't constrained by working in some narrow subdiscipline. And I'm glad of that because it just wouldn't have fit my personality or my uh, my talent actually very well. I would have been in real danger of getting bored. Uh, uh, but but if you do like I did, then you really need to be prepared to uh, uh, live with maybe not getting the same level of recognition you would have gotten otherwise. Although you know it's a fifty fifty thing I mean, by doing. The Danforth people said, you won't, you are not even going to be able to graduate, much less get a job. Um, you know, I did graduate. I did get a job. And because I'd worked early on in a field before others were there, or many others were there, I was by no means the only one there. We had worked there before many others were there. We, we ended up being viewed as pioneers. You know, we wrote a paper that has five and a half thousand citations now. Uh, as you know, with four graduate students as co-authors, so um, you know it's it's a high risk, high reward to do what we did. Had I waited until I had tenure, I mean, well, I never got tenure, so that's another difference. You know, I did prediction company instead of getting tenure, and um, uh, but had I taken that path, well, I would have missed the train with chaos and perhaps even complex systems. So, uh, you know, life is short. So there's, there's a trade-off and you have to decide how much risk you're willing to take in pursuing the kind of career that I did. Well, well I have to say that judging from the, the questions coming in on, on Q&A, you haven't managed to put many people in, in the audience off. I'm, I'm aware of time. And so, so one, one question, one last question for now, and it's coming from someone who's currently an undergraduate at Oxford who's wondering, if they, they didn't even want to wait until they're a graduate student, let alone until they have tenure. You know, are there ways for, for undergraduates who are interested in, in really getting involved in interdisciplinary work to, to do that? And I guess on a deeper level, insofar as there aren't, you know, do you think that's something that, that, that we should seek to address in the coming years? Well, I think there are ways. I mean, if you're studying X, you can go take an internship or participate in a research project in Y. Uh, that can be a very good thing to do. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think increasingly those possibilities exist. We've hosted interns uh, that have done that uh, at, at uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking at, at Oxford um, and in my group. Um, you know, I think 
The other thing is just be intellectually active. A lot of my thinking about complex systems was actually formed in discussions with two other undergraduates when I was at Stanford, Bill Wooders and Ron Cates. You know, we would go out at lunchtime and sit there on the lawn and and ask questions of each other and discuss things. And um, so I, that was a big part of my intellectual development. Terrific. Well, well I'm, 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 I'm being told that we be, we need to begin wrapping things up at this side, but that's been that's been an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much for sharing those yeah, you know, those memories and recollections, because I know you, you said at the start that it sometimes feels a bit egotistical to talk about your career. But 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 honestly, I think sometimes approaching these things with with the example of of how someone has moved between fields and how that's advanced their thought, it's a more powerful way for communicating that message than you know all the theory in the world and then some. So yeah, I just want to thank Great. you. Thank, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this.